The ASN Young Investigators Award is presented annually to an individual with an outstanding record of achievement and creativity in basic or patient-oriented research related to the functions and diseases of the kidney. In this episode of the ASN Kidney News Podcast, ASN Director of Policy and Public Affairs, Paul Smedberg, speaks with 2010 recipient Nicholas Katsanis, Ph.D., as well as former ASN President and Young Investigator Award winner, Peter Aronson, M.D. Dr. Katsanis, you have some very interesting research. Could you explain briefly for us what your research is about? Sure. I have been interested for a very long time in trying to understand the genetic basis and the biological basis, molecular basis, of a rare disorder called barley beetle syndrome. This is something that I've been following since my postdoctoral days at Baylor in the late 90s. We started appreciating that what we consider to be a straightforward Mendelian autosomal recessive genetic disorder morphed itself into something a lot more complicated and as we're beginning to see a lot more representative of what we now believe genetic architecture to be in humans. And from that really arose a key question which still vexes me and I imagine will vex me for the rest of my career, which is how does variation in a human's genome reflect into their medical presentation? The, the second piece is a serendipitous finding that really started it all, and that is the realization a few years ago we were able to show that body beetle syndrome was caused by defects in primary cilia. That was co- coincident with a number of other discoveries, primarily from mouse models that of uh, polycystic kidney disease uh, that were also caused by defective cilia, either structurally defective or functionally defective cilia. And that has really catapulted us into the midst of a maelstrom of research, which has become very exciting for us. A major part of our activity these days is to try to understand what physiological processes our primary cilia involved with, how the cilia signal translate into the interior of the cell, and of course, as a consequence, as we start to unstitch pathways and, and, and put the pieces together, to start to ask the question, if we can improve function either at the site of the primary cilium or downstream from the primary cilium with obviously uh, potential therapeutic ramifications. And I think that's it in a, in a nutshell. So for the people listening to this podcast today who aren't scientists, what are the potential implications of your research, particularly for people listening who are looking to improve care for people with kidney disease? Even though we have the ability to obtain genetic information for a human, now very cheaply and very efficiently. It used to be a particular gene, now it's entire people's entire genomes and this and that. Interpretive ability of what is going to happen to any single patient who walks into any single clinic is limited primarily to epidemiology. To clarify a little bit more, so let's say that you find a mutation in gene A that you know from previous studies that will cause, for example, PKD, or it doesn't have a PKD. Take breast cancer, for example, because I think this is a larger problem. It is impossible for us to say, by looking at an individual's genetic information, how the disease is going to progress, at what speed, at what rate, at what severity, and so on and so forth. And that is in part because there is variation elsewhere in the, in the individual's genome that is affecting these processes. So the challenge in front of us is not just to diagnose an individual with PKD, dominant, recessive, and so on and so forth. But the challenge is to be able to make informed decisions about the management and, of course, informed decisions about the future therapeutic implications. And it is my view that as we begin to understand genetic architecture of these rare syndromic disorders, we will begin to inform the predictive power of genetic information, which at this moment in time is bereft from our field. In patients with body beetle syndrome, about one in four, perhaps a little bit less than one in four patients, will require a renal transplant. And we know this information because many of my colleagues have studied hundreds of these patients and we have a population-based approach to the problem. However, our ability to discriminate who will specifically will require a transplant is uh, precisely nil. And as you can imagine, that is very important because I, I don't need to tell uh, folks what the odds are of getting an organ, uh, the complications about getting into a transplant registry list, the priority scores that you might receive in order to, get, to go up this list, and so on and so forth. 
So it, it would be wonderful to be able to tell a family that, yes, even though you have Barney Beetle syndrome, your chances of having renal failure are very, very small, versus another family that will have to say your chances of getting renal failure are very, very high, and we need to monitor this aggressively, and we need to take um, uh, more aggressive steps and so on and so forth. So this is the one piece. And the second piece, of course, is it's like everything else. In order to fix the engine, you need to understand what's busted. If you want to try to understand what therapeutic paradigms you have developed, you have to know uh, to have a knowledge of the parts. You have to understand the connectivity between them, uh, and you have to know what their output is. So, Dr. Katanas, tell us what receiving the Young Investigator Award from ASN means to you. There's no greater personal satisfaction than being recognized by your peers for your work. The model that of research we have been doing over the past eight years since I've had my laboratory has been a widely inclusive model of research. I have had the pleasure to collaborate with probably over 50 laboratories. I'm a very strong believer that in many ways we are beginning to exhaust our ability to make profound progress by following a single track approach in our research. In addition, whether we like it or not, we're all tainted by our own personal biases as we go through life. It's unavoidable. We're human. So it is this interdisciplinarity and collegiality that, that I feel is the next magic bullet for us. And I'm tremendously pleased that people have recognized the work. And the last thing I have to tell you is uh, I feel a little bit of a burden from the point of view. I, I took, took a look uh, at the previous awardees. I know I have the pleasure of having Dr. Arson on the line today. And you go, you know, uh, holy smokes, you know, these guys have moved on, they've carried on to do good work, and so on and so forth, and you do feel a burden of responsibility to continue to carry on, to continue to push yourself, and uh, so keep your eye on the ball. Dr. Aronson, you, I'm sure, can recall some of the feelings you had. Many people may not know, actually, you were first recipient of the Young Investigator Award from ASN back in 1985. How would you describe your experience since receiving the award? The award uh, gets better retroactively <laughs> because with people like Dr. Uh, Katsanis uh, receiving it, it brings honor to the award itself. When you're the first recipient, the, the actual the award doesn't have any kind of a standard, actually. So, you know, it's so exciting for me as a former recipient to see ever better uh, and more outstanding people receive the award because that retroactively, <laughs> in a way, brings more honor to, to us earlier recipients. So, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Katsanis and, and thank for bringing ever greater honor to the award itself. Well, not only seeing the satisfaction of bright, young, early career folks receiving this award, you've also had the difficult task of deciding who is going to get the award. Can you describe a little bit of those deliberations? I think for the Young Investigator Award in particular, is an emphasis on, of course, the quality of the research, but people who've attained research accomplishment in an independent way. And that, Dr. Katsanis made a fabulous point about how modern multidisciplinary research is often very collaborative. But nevertheless, there's no question that there's a body of work uh, where his impact is very direct, and he's been the leader of these collaborative efforts. So I think that a really a key criterion for the Young Investigator Award from the early days to the present time is reflect an outstanding body of work by someone who is an independent investigator, someone who's not functioning as a junior member of a senior member's team. That would not be somebody who would be appropriate recipient, and indeed nobody like that has ever received the award. So I think that Dr. Katsanis is really just a fantastic representative of, of I think, what the ideal is for, for this award. Dr. Katsanis, what are your goals over the next five years for your career? Uh, I don't particularly want to know, uh, because if I try to become too formulaic, I run the danger of boxing myself in and perhaps keeping my eyes closed to, you know, opportunities, oblique discoveries that might take me in a new direction that I haven't thought about. So, in a very broad sense, I just hope to continue to be doing interesting science of clinical and medical relevance. I very much enjoy the days when my postdocs will come prancing into my office and say, oh, look at this blood. Isn't this interesting? And I know we don't know anything about this topic, and I don't know we know anything about these other proteins that I just pulled out, but I think it's cool, and I think we should work on this. Because I do want to be able to empower genetic information uh, and give it predictive value, as I mentioned earlier. The other thing is both a pragmatic, a practical, and an emotional goal is uh, the time has come that we have received enough information about 
ciliary disorders that it's time to start taking pot shots at making things better. That will require a different toolkit, that will require a different set of collaborators with different types of expertise, but I think it's possible. And I should say that, you know, being recognized by my community is one of the little bullets that I can have to entice people to continue sort of working on these things. It's, it's one of those things. But this yeah. sort of thing. And I think if I had to summarize the reasons that I'm, uh, that I'm being honored with this and, the re- and many of the reasons why the science has gone well over the last few years is because I had extraordinary mentors. And I don't mean extraordinary mentors because they were good scientists. I think, I mean, that is true. But they were extraordinary humans who were able to pick you up when you were down, give you a little bit of encouragement to put a little bit of perspective into your life when you were in a little bit bit of the doldrums, especially, you know, there's this mid-graduate student hump that many people go through, the the mid-postal crisis. So now, Dr. Katsanis, if you had the opportunity to ask Dr. Aronson one question, what would it be? The core fear that I've always carried in my life. <laughs> well, I just, and, and that goes to how do you – and there, again, let me just say there's no right or wrong answer. I just, I, I'm just dead keen to be hearing um, what colleagues of mine who have been able to survive and flourish in the field for a very long time, how they, what, what their approach to this was. And the question is, we're all very enthusiastic when we start out, and then you get beaten down, and then you lose your enthusiasm, and then something good happens, and then you're gaining. But I always keep in mind my mind that one has to keep their activity fresh. One has to keep themselves as unjaded as possible. And different folks have taken different approaches. People move, people retrain, people refocus every few years. A colleague of mine was telling me that he mandatorily reboots his research enterprise every se- every seven years or so. And I just wanted to hear Dr. Aronson's thought because I, I'd love to hear from successful investigators who've been at it for a little while. And And how do you do it? Well, first of all, I, you know, I've had a, a probably a much uh, smaller lab than some, uh, so in, in some ways it's easier to maintain that, and I've been fortunate having really good people. But I think you already hit on it in your earlier remarks. That I've always considered that I was extraordinarily lucky in terms of one thing sort of leading to another, more or less by serendipity, and in, and in following those things that necessarily required methodological changes or technical change. So it was never a matter of just sort of setting out and saying, well, uh, I've been doing this kind of research for a while, now I need to train in this technique. It was more, oh, this is a funny observation, and in pursuing this, that necessarily took us into other methods. It's really the love of the process that ultimately drives us. I always thought it was a little bit like a career in the arts, that if you enjoy the process, the ends will take care of themselves. So, Dr. Aronson, how can ASN, in your opinion, increase interest in nephrology as a career among medical residents and students? Well, I, I think that it's talking about now a couple of different things. You're, you're really speaking as a clinical field, uh, clinical, sort yeah. of in the context of our conversation here. I think, first of all, I think an important point needs to be made that I think that Dr. Katsanis uh, represents, again, how discoveries in one field can affect another field and how things that seem to be unrelated can suddenly converge. And and again, it kind of feeds my bias about why people shouldn't do too much very specific strategic planning about research because you never know <laughs> where the breakthroughs are going to come from. Uh, in a sense, I, I think it's fair to say he probably didn't start out thinking about kidney research as an end in itself. He was very interested in a specific uh, multi-system genetic disease that happened to involve the kidney, and then his research has just beautifully converged with other themes that had come out of people that were studying kidney research for its own sake. So I think that from a research point of view, people can come into this field from all different directions. And, and again, that's the beauty of science is following one discovery with another and seeing where it takes you. Now, in terms of nephrology as a clinical field, I think that that's part of our job. I think those of us who are in renal sections or doing kidney research is part of our teaching roles in academic institutions to make kidney biology fascinating for our students, for our residents, uh, and help them get exposed to it. And it's a, it's a fabulously dynamic field uh, and has everything from uh, important public health and ethical questions and health services research down to new discoveries about organelles that nobody realized what they did before. So it's just, it's got the whole spectrum. It's a fantastic field and we have to somehow get the word out. Dr. Katsanis, why did you decide to pursue a career as a researcher? This is a, uh, it's a complicated question. Well, it's a simple question, but it's good. Simple question in a way, yeah. Well, it's, it never is a simple question. 
the I'm sorry, I don't want to sound really melodramatic here, but um, <laughs> there was a very rare uh, lethal genetic disorder in my family uh, when I was a child. Uh, my first cousin was severely affected from um, from San Filippo syndrome, and uh, it's a horrible neurological disease. It goes for about 12, 15 years, and then you die. And uh, I was uh, very, very young at the time. Between the ages of 8 to 12 is when I sort of experienced most of it. I have these very vivid memories. And I decided at the t- that time, quite frankly, that this is not appropriate and nobody should have to go through this. And I thought, well, somebody's got to do something about it. Now, of course, I, I made a conscious choice to avoid working on all these disorders because I feel that I have an emotional investment in, and I would be too biased, and that would be not right. But I do have a deep desire to improve you know, healthcare, improve management from the sort of 5,000 feet down view. So that was one piece. Uh, and the second piece is, for better or for worse, I became truly fascinated with genetics as uh, a junior and senior high school student. And, of course, what I became fascinated with had nothing to do with what genetics really is today because I was looking at Punnett squares and things of that nature, you know, Mendel's wrinkle pea. <laughs> I thought it was the coolest thing ever. So that was great, and I decided to take a degree in genetics, which I did at UCL. And then about halfway through my degree, uh, I decided it might be a good idea to try out a, a summer internship in a lab just to see what it was like. And that's when I got hit by a stone wall because, of course, the laboratory experience had nothing to do. There were no wrinkle peas anywhere in sight. But what was there was a study on tuberous sclerosis. And I became completely enthralled. I decided that this environment was it for me. I had a bit of a epiphany moment, whatever you want to call it, and I decided there and then that I couldn't see myself ever doing anything else. So it was a win-win because what I do gives me an emotional satisfaction of sort of greater purpose, if you like. And again, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be sappy, but many of us do feel that way. You know, just nobody, nobody wants to say it because it sounds lame, but a lot of us I know feel that this sort of thing gives us a purpose in life greater than ourselves. And at the same time, I get to satisfy my own intellectual curiosity at, with the benefit of fantastic inde- inter- intellectual independence, autonomy, and the ability to interact with a very broad range of people. It's the best job in the world. What, are you kidding? There you go. Best job in the world. There you go. So, Dr. Katsanis, to, to close out here, I uh, wanted to give you an opportunity to discuss how you think ASN can help the next generation of researchers pursue their dreams and their goals. That is a tough one. With regard to the society, what I can tell you is that perhaps I can share some of my experiences with the other major society I'm involved with, which is the American Society of Human Genetics. And we talked about this before, but there is a clear gap in some of the very sensitive points in career transitions. And it seems to me that this is one area that we might think about ways to, to, to help. People need to be mentored, and people need to be led by example in the, in the broader sense. So although at the end of the day, Everything distills down to money, money for fellowship, money for transition grants, money for early investigator grants, to which the societies in general can, can, can play a lobbying role, but nothing beyond that. I do believe that this lobbying role is important. I'm not sure how much it's heard, but it's one of those things. If you don't lobby and if you don't push, you're not going to get anything. So that is one piece of it. But the second piece of it is national meetings um, and, and events of that sort – are a wonderful opportunity to put blends of junior and senior people together. And I know that the ASN does a little bit of this. The American Society of Human Genetics does an awful lot of this. Research forums where investigators who have been around the block a couple of times spend a short period of time I'll actually outline what Lord Arison was suggesting for the, for the plenary talk. How did I get there? What mistakes did I make? And I remember one year, for example, we had a little panel in the American Society of Human Genetics, where we had people not only from the track of research, but also we had scientific publishing and somebody from the NIH and somebody from industry and so on and so forth, just to give people, just to demystify what these various possibilities as career paths are to the younger people, graduate students, medical students, uh, postdoctoral fellows or clinical residents and fellows, about the options that they might have. And that was followed up by informal chit-chat, when people can network and look for a job. Um, mentor uh, men, uh, mentor student luncheons and things of that nature and interaction so that we, you can tell people you know what life used to suck for me too in 2000 and something for six months when I couldn't get this particular experiment to work but see it worked out just to give those guys a little bit of 
perspective that wonderful things that actually happen to you. If you if demonstrate what my old prof used to call stick to itiveness, which I think one of the major attributes for science these days. Great. And Dr. Aronson, what do you think ASN can do to help the next generation of researchers and clinicians? Well, I think Dr. Kasana's uh, suggestion for the national meeting is actually an excellent one. I, I've been off the ASN Council now for just a little bit of time, but I know that there was a lot of discussion about trying to add in an organized way opportunities for young investigators to meet you know, with more senior investigators for the kinds of discussions you just described. You know, the ASN itself uh, has actually put a, a lot of, uh, besides lobbying intensively, uh, has also focused its funds on the uh, fellow to faculty transition, that so-called KDR transition, because this is a place where, one, as Dr. Katsanis already mentioned, is one of the places where people drop out or at least feel extraordinary stress. And I think that the ASN uh, has been very effective in, in focusing its grant program on a place where there's a little bit of a gap in the NIH system and where a small amount of money can make a big difference in, in, a, in a specific field. So I think that the ASN's grant program directed at young emerging investigators has been very effective during the years I was involved in helping to run it. Uh, uh, any number of people would, who would receive these grants uh, stopped me at the ASN meeting to express their gratitude, not so much even for the dollars, but how much it meant to them to get support at that stage of their career where it was otherwise easy maybe to get a little bit depressed. So, so I think that the ASN has actually been very effective in that regard. And Obviously, with more funds could be even more effective. Uh, lobbying is important. As Dr. Katsanis mentioned, you have to keep trying whether or not it seems to be having major effects or not. Uh, and But as well, I think organizing the sorts of things he's suggested uh, would be a good idea and maybe should be expanded at our national meeting. And Dr. Katsanis, I'm, I'm curious. You spent a good part of your educational career um in, in Europe and uh, went to many uh, prestigious schools over there, and now you're in the U.S. Uh, do you see major differences in how, you know, the Europeans, say, train future researchers versus what happens here in the U.S.? Oh, enormous differences. Well, I can't speak for, I mean, Europe is, you know, 44 countries, so, I, you know, we'll come with a blanket statement. I usually joke to my students to say that the perfect educational system is probably going to be found in the Azores because it's right between Europe and the United States. Because it seems to me, the um, in the UK, the philosophy of uh, of a PhD student, I can't speak to uh, uh, residency and fellowship training, but I can speak to graduate student training because I have experiences as a mentor and as a student. And in Europe, uh, there is a very big drive towards independence from the very early on. It was, I remember when I first started my PhD, there was none of this study for a year and a bit or maybe two as it is in some institutions. Then we'll go through another X number of years and we'll, you'll meet with committees and all this and that. It was, here's your bench, here's a bunch of paper, your pet tips, uh, here's the budget number that you order, uh, uh, and see you later and we'll meet every week and we'll find out what you're doing. Very strong evidence on self-development. That was a good thing because at the fullness of time, we are all asked to be independent thinkers and independent scientists. However, this is also a bad thing because it is much harder to pick up the people who are failing and, and to try to have a mechanism to offer a helping hand. In the United States, we have gone to the other extreme end where it is my cynical view that some students walk around with a silver spoon in their mouth where they need to have they need their committees and their mentors to think for them. We're talking about the average. We all understand that there's going to be exceptional students at both ends of the distribution who are exceptionally good or exceptionally bad. But it seems to me that here the system is perhaps too mentored. Uh, there's too much oversight. There's too much cuddling going on. And the challenge is to find the median where you foment independence while at the same time making sure that the student is protected for sometimes a poor mentor whether the student is protected from himself or herself. And, and this is a key difference. And this is at the student level. At the laboratory level, we have, my observation is that we have a major cultural difference. And for better or for worse, it, is, it, it has to do with the availability of money. And this might change. But in the United States, my experience was there's a far more how shall I put it, can-do attitude in a, very, in, in, in a very broad scope. 
And there's this, what I always called youthful exuberance about collaborations. And it was partly driven because there's a little bit more money in the system. So people are perhaps a little bit less cautious about spending an extra X dollar amount. Well, I want to thank both of you for being with us here today. Dr. Katsanis, congratulations on your award, and we all look forward to hearing your talk at Renal Week. And Dr. Aronson, thank you for participating and for all your leadership over the years, uh, not only with the ASN, but in the, the renal field and the research air arena, and most recently with ASN's grant program. So thanks to both of you very much. This podcast is copyrighted by the American Society of Nephrology, all rights reserved. All content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be medical advice. The information in this podcast should not be used during a medical emergency or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. Please consult your doctor or other qualified health care provider if you have any questions about any medical condition or before taking any drug, changing your diet, or commencing or discontinuing any course of treatment. Thank you for listening to this podcast of the American Society of Nephrology.